everybody. Welcome to Polly's Whiskey Tasting Class. My name's Dave and I'll be taking you through a curated tour of five different uh, whiskies from around the world. Let's start with how to taste whiskey. Now that might sound a bit counterintuitive, everyone just puts it in their mouth, but it's actually quite a, a ritual to it and a necessary one as well. Hold up to the light, see the colour. As you swirl it round the glass, you'll see it sticks to the side. In wine culture, that's called the legs. It's used to judge the alcoholic content of the whiskey. But in this case, it also aerates the whiskey. So then, when we bring it up to the nose, you get more of the flavour as those oils are released. Important thing when smelling whiskey, you don't dive in there, you're not going scuba diving. Just gently bring it up to the nose, in through the nose, out through the mouth with the mouth partially open. Then take a small sip and swill it round the mouth. You do it with me. Breathe through it. Feel the flavours come up. Now it doesn't matter if you're not getting the same flavours around right the back of the label, you're your own best guest. In fact, if you could map your taste buds, which go from your sinuses down to your small intestine, you'd have something more individual than a thumbprint. So whatever memories, flavours that brings off, go with it. It's supposed to be enjoyed. But to increase your enjoyment, a touch of water, yes I know whiskey's supposed to be sacred, but actually it was made to be enjoyed. This will help. Hold it up to the light, a small drop of water, and you'll see that it becomes more oily. You've upset the chemical balance of the stable compound. But then when you do the same thing, swirl, again gently up to the nose. When you take a sip, you'll find it's more comfortable. The burn has actually faded away and you can swill and chew and even do the Hannibal Lecter th -th -th through it. Do it with me. It doesn't matter if you spill a little bit while that, that's why having a beard actually helps. But this is all about what kind of flavours you're getting out of it. Now immediately you should notice from most whiskies you'll get a bit of vanilla, uh, a bit of caramel, that's part of the barrel ageing. But what other fl uh, flavours that come out of it that are personal to you are about your personal enjoyment of the whisky. The first one we're going to try is uh, the Irish. Uh, the very name whisky comes from the Irish Ishkabaha. Uh, which slowly got anglicised into the word whiskey over the next few hundred years. Irish whiskey was the first licensed whiskey produced in 1605 uh, by Bushmills in County Antrim. With historical events, Irish whiskey dropped off from the number one selling whiskey in the world over the next couple of hundred years, from about the 1700s through to there was only three whiskey distilleries left in Ireland. Over the last 15 years, there's been a glut of new ones, making gin, making rum, making vodka, and most importantly, making whiskey. So we've seen it go from three distilleries to about 70 in the last 15 years. Slane is only about three years uh, old as a distillery, although they are, uh, are launching their products. Uh, situated in County Meath in Ireland, they've taken quite a, I suppose, futuristic view of it, whereas normally uh, Irish whiskey is just distilled for three to five years in uh, old ex-American oak barrels. In this case, they've used new American oak, used American oak, ex-bourbon barrels, for that nice little sweetness and carameliness, and then they've used sherry barrels, which at this time, especially in Europe, are fantastically expensive, so they really put everything they can into this. So just as before, had swirl, should be able to, after, after that first one, a nice kind of rich, oily vanilla, but a bit short on the finish, and this is where our water comes in, just like before. Now, when you nose, and with the water you can get a bit further into it, you should be able to taste the red grape tannins, definitely the oak comes out more. Irish whiskey being a bit lighter, being triple distilled, you don't get that heavy leather and oak, but once you swill it around and chew it, mm, there. I'm a 
almost like grape stems and red wine tannins coming through right on the top of your mouth that dryness that when you get not a thick red not like a Barossa Valley Shiraz but like a really nice Merlot or uh, even a, a, a fine Pinot Noir but then almost on the top of your gums there there'll be that lovely sweet vanilla uh, oh that's just sorry I'm gonna need a moment alone the second one we're gonna taste Bomo 12 year old is the one that inherited Irish whiskey's mantle uh, between the mid 1700s right the way through until the modern day Scotch whiskey has dominated the European whiskey scene. Uh, it, this is the where single malt and the variety of single malt came from. If you didn't know where the term single malt comes from it means single, one distillery, as opposed to blended between many distilleries, which most whiskey was and still is to this day. 95% or 94% of the world's whiskey that's sold is blended whiskey. But even single malt is blended from different barrels to create a consistent bottle for the consumer. Now, you're gonna notice something very different from the first one we tried. Even without the water. Smoky. No, smoky, especially smoky Scotch whiskey, is a beautiful accident. They find that when malting the barley uh, that goes into the whiskey, they had to use in, on, in the islands what fuel was around. And a lot of the ground is so acidic on the Scottish islands, uh, being sprayed with sea salt water and gusting winds all the time, the trees are actually quite red. So they would cut sods of turf to use as fuel and that produces a very aromatic smoke when malting the barley. That smoke got passed on into the whiskey and they actually thought it was ruined for a while but turns out people liked it, I know I do. Same thing as before, just a drop. Lovely and oily. Yeah, I find the water actually brings out that golden colour especially when you hold it up to the light. Now, that delicate sea salt there. Uh, you can almost be standing on a cliff somewhere. Maybe not drinking too much whiskey, but... Oh, that's glorious. And also... A perfume flower, kind of? Mmm, more vegetable, actually, than anything. Which can be a little off-putting if, if you're not used to smoky whiskies, but then take, uh, after that initial sip, take a nice big gulp. And the salt gives way to a lovely apricot, a smoked apricot actually in this case. Even a barbecue kind of smell, charcoal. Nice bit of fresh leather oil or something. And then finally finishing in normally like the cereal citrusy notes but I find with this one as it goes down you get a lovely almost caramel treacle kind of spread as it goes down the throat where well, you've got taste buds all the way down and it just kind of opens up and develops one of the richer whiskies we've got today as opposed to some of the lighter styles and 12 years old because it takes that long in a cold country like Scotland for the barrel to actually work on the whiskey all does not necessarily better but when it comes to the structure of the whiskey and how long they've had to wait until it's perfect, you won't find many a better drop than this. Third whiskey we're going to try in our trip around the world is bourbon. Now, I know, especially in Australia, bourbon hasn't had the best run of it, RTD, King, and all the rest of it. But bourbon actually changed the face of how whiskey is, is served, is bottled, is is sold and the American market which was European settlers coming over with grain like rye and then discovering corn in uh, the southern states of America where it grew much better than rye in warmer climates produced twice the yield four times the amount of grain uh, and a lot more alcohol and high quality alcohol they slowly moved from making European style rye whiskey in America over to corn whiskey and then eventually what we know to be bourbon today. But bourbon is, 
extremely important for one main reason, is that it's the reason why whiskey is sold in bottles. Before then, whiskey was sold in barrels to grocers, the most famous being Scotch merchants like Johnny Walker or in London, James Pimps. They would, you would buy whiskey and wait. You'd go down there with a saucepan or the flagon with the lid and you buy it. Okay, I'll have that much to take home to Granny. Brown Foreman in America, who first produced uh, Old Forest of Bourbon, were so sick of moonshiners like fake branding their barrels or unscrupulous grocers uh, selling fake whiskey but putting their brand on it that they decided to bottle the whiskey for terms of consistency and customer satisfaction. This was one of the very first brands. Uh, the whiskey itself has a nice balance of corn. A lot of American bourbons have rye in there with that lovely nutty bitterness. Uh, again, goes really well with the caramel and vanilla. Anyone who's had a brownie will be able to tell you that. And as we've added our water and... That's the best part of my job. Uh, you can actually feel it ease down gently, as opposed to maybe the more harsh versions. In terms of the flavours that you get, you get the lovely sweetness of the corn, that cereal kind of nutty oiliness, but as well, the Americans were the first people to actually perfect the charring of the inside of the barrel. That opens the pores of the inside of the barrel, creates caramelized sugars that come to the fore, and as the whiskey barrel breathes the whiskey in and out of the wood, then you get those vanillin and those oaky, leathery flavors. But they're all quite tamed down against the sweetness, so there's nothing too much in either way. Also, most bourbons will incorporate a small amount of rye. I think. Uh, Old Forester is about 12, 14% rye, and those bitter fennel flavors, they balance out against the sweetness. And that's really what they're after. Mostly they'll add uh, either a bit of winter wheat or uh, some malted barley to kind of round it off and give you that whiskey, familiar whiskey texture that you'd be looking for. Uh, in terms of texture, very smooth, rich sweet at the front, but then nice and soft down the side. It doesn't hurt. The fourth whiskey we'll be trying is a Japanese one, Kureyashi. This is a pure blended malt. Now there's been a lot of excitement about Japanese whiskey in the last few years, deservedly so. Gorgeous stuff. Uh, learned their trade pretty much in Scotland uh, from 1910 to about 1932 where they started opening their first distilleries uh, the biggest one of which was Yamanashi uh, by Suntory. We are seeing smaller sake breweries and sochu distilleries starting on their own whiskey blends and this is a very exciting ad addition because just as the noted whiskey writer uh, Dave Broom said a few years ago it was only a matter of time before we see international blends. So this one is, if you like, down to Japanese roots, which originate in Scotland. So this is a blend of Scotch malt whiskey and Japanese malt whiskey, which is then aged in Japan for three to five years, uh, depending on the consistency of the climate around the year. And then they'll put it together to make something entirely new, an international malt whiskey. It's quite special. Same as before. You see it's quite light in colour. That's down to the age in a cold climate. It only has to be at age for three years to be classed as whiskey internationally. But you see it's such a pale golden colour. But on the nose it's actually... It's quite intense. Pine needles? Forest? Then on that first taste, lovely citrusy rum raisin notes about it. But when we do this, and this is really, you can see the difference with a pale whiskey. You can just see the oil shine and give it a good swirl. Oh no, it just rushes out. Yeah, you've got your vanilla, you got the caramel's actually really light and salted like taffy on. Gorgeous. 
orange blossom, maybe a bit of rose, macadamia, uh, any kind of those really oily, nutty flavours, even a bit of Brazil, nothing dry like walnut. You should start salivating straight away because it's quite a dry whiskey. The finish is intensely dry, which reminds me of some uh, dry French dessert wines, maybe? No, not dessert. Victorian Apera. Because it's still got an oiliness going down, but then you get that lovely, rich, honey grape flavour. This will go great with dessert, actually. Uh, not something heavy like chocolate ice cream, maybe a, a souffle. Yeah, oh, that's sensational. I'm gonna have a bit more, sorry. But still with that dry finish, so you could have another very easily. It's quite Moorish. I have to say, Japanese whiskey has been exceptional over the last few years, if you can find it. But uh, yeah, that's a keeper. Find it if you can get it. The last one we're going to try uh, is Stout. Victorian homegrown success. Launched about 13 years ago now. Their original uh, mission statement, I suppose, was to become the House Australian. So you've got your House Bourbon, you've got your House Vodka, your, these things that are actually quite cheap to produce. But it turned out when they were going for the kind of excellence that Starwood were going for, it became a top shelf product and when you taste it you will know why so same as before give it a wee swirl give it a wee nose so this is two and a half to three years old and the thing we taste in young whiskey is the cereal the grains it's made from in the case of starwood twofold wheat and malted barley that really comes through, it provides a freshness and almost a savoury kind of feeling as well. The thing is, when it comes to Starwood, a lot of people will fall into that trap thinking maybe old whiskey is better. If you're talking about Scotch or Irish, it's cold up there. It takes 12 to 15 years to make a decent whiskey. In Victoria, well, especially Melbourne, I know it doesn't feel like it all the time, but it very rarely gets below five degrees and it very rarely gets above 40. So the whiskey barrel's just working all the time. So if it only takes two or three years to make something taste this good, age is just a number. Working round. Raisins. Grape. Actually, apricot. That kind of stone fruit kind of flavour. Give it another smell because I'm bread and butter pudding or even fresh bread out of the oven actually. And lastly to finish, it's not a dry finish, it's actually quite a succulent finish. Going along with those fruity flavours as well. Uh, which is stuff we don't normally think about when we talk about grain products, you know, but Grapefruit as well in there, citrusy feel coming through. It just keeps repeating, especially once you've added that drop of water. Thanks for your kind attention, guys. I hope you enjoyed Polybar's whiskey class. If you've got any questions about the products you've tried here today, feel free to contact us via the link. Hope to see you soon. Cheers.